standing when I was first saw a congregation song. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we stand here before you this morning. We realize that without you we are nothing. We know that you brought this day to pass that John and Julie to be married and holy matrimony. Lord, we just thank you that this privilege for them has come. And we're here to bless and, and encourage them. And Lord, we just thank you for your blessing. Lord. Pray, Lord, you bless each of the participants also. Just help us all, Lord, as we worship and we serve you together. We'd like to sing my memory. Okay, we'd like to sing together, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no
I'll just give the order of the service. Uh, we have the opening by Malin Petrie, who is from Gap Mills, uh, West Virginia. It's not Gap Mills anymore, is it? But it's West Virginia. Uh, Rennick, West Virginia. And uh, he's going to be giving devotional. That's uh, the groom's pastor. And then uh, we'll have Sanford Yoder, the brother of the bride, give the sermon, the message. And then uh, David Yoder, the father of the bride, is going to perform the ceremony and give further instructions. So God bless you.
Words of encouragement. Words, words that lift her up. Words that make her feel like she's, she is the only person. These words will make it so that she can love you in a way that you, you don't realize at this point. Words are beautiful. They can make us feel like we are what we should be, or they can make us feel like what we shouldn't be. And I just like to encourage that. You know, many times we, we fail to open our mouths and to say communication is so important in the Christian home or in any, any relationship, in the workplace, in the home, but so much more in a married relationship. It suffers long and is kind, brother, <coughs> sister. It bondeth not itself. Your pleasure to each other is whenever the, your happiness, the other is happy, then you become happy. We live in a world that is selfish. We live in a world that only thinks about what I can get out of it, but not in the Christian home. The Christian home is where I manifest Christ to my companion. I manifest Christ to the world. Brother and sister, I, I want your lives to be that whenever you walk down the street, hand in hand, people will turn and say, what makes that couple act that way? What makes them be that way? What is about them that radiates? What, what, what are we seeing? That you can manifest Christ to a world that is hungry and thirsting after something they're missing. They're missing. That's my prayer for you. That's my hope for you. That's our, our desire for you. Remember, whatever he says, do it. That's for these two and for each one of us. Whatever he says, do it. I'd like to give a little testimony of an experience I had some years ago. A neighbor man that I never met before come to me and ask me if I would scrape his driveway. And he said, uh, how long have you lived here? Well, I said about two years. Well, he said, I thought you lived here all your life. He said, the way people talk about you. What I'm trying, I, I give this to the glory of God, what I'm trying to manifest, brothers and sisters, we go about our daily lives, we just live our lives in normal as children of God. And it radiates a testimony without words spoken to a world that's needy, to a world that is wanting to see what makes you operate the way you do. Why do you? Why are you what you are? Because you do what he said. Whatever he says, do it. Because of Christ. Not because of us, but because of Christ. That's the beauty of relationship. In the Christian home. And God is on the side of it. That's the wonderful thing. The man that turned the water into water is the man, brother and sister, that can make your lives flow beautifully together. And be a testimony, whether you speak it or not, it'll be spoken every person you meet. And we'll bless you. you all in the worthy name of Jesus Christ. As I sat here just a few minutes ago and watched Julie and Johnny walk in, I wasn't expecting this flood of emotion because all of a sudden I had this mental image of this tiny little girl laying in a crib in our house in Snyder County, Pennsylvania. Six months old, she weighed 10 pounds. She needed love. And I want 
much to walk in today. I just, I just thank God for the things that He does in the world with love. share with you today some thoughts about the subject. I've chosen to title the subject today, Love Does. And I, I was so blessed with what Brother Malin shared. It's an excellent backdrop for where I want to go with this today. I look in the world around today, and I see a lot of people who approach this idea of love from the perspective of what it will do for me, what can I get out of it? How will it make me feel? And there's a, there's a term that I've heard used in various ways that I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about over the last six weeks as I thought about preparing for this. And the more I thought about this term, the more I became concerned about what this term communicates to us today. You've probably heard the phrase performance-based relationships. Now, I don't know what goes through your mind when you think of performance-based relationships, but it's often used to describe a relationship where the only thing that is really happening uh, is not emotion. There's no real connection. The only thing that's really happening is there's the expectation of service that comes my way. You do what I want you to do, and then I'll be happy with you. And I, I think we understand instinctively in our hearts that that is not what we're called to do. And I've noticed this coming out in a phrase that I've seen popping up in various ways. I've seen it on Facebook. I've heard people say this. But they say, I want you to love me for who I am, not for what I do. And I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about this. And what troubles me about this term, performance-based relationships, is that it is so easy for that term to communicate to us that performance in a relationship should not be there. There should be no expectation of that in a relationship. That the only thing that matters is who I am not what I do. That relationships are all about being and that doing has nothing to do with it. In other words, love who I am. Leave what I do alone. Don't put any expectations on me. Now, I certainly agree that obviously we need to be the right thing. It's a lot easier to do the right thing when I am being the right thing. But I will confess to you this morning, this afternoon, that I don't always feel like being the right thing. My wife and children can tell you that's true. I don't always feel like being like I should. So I have a question for you. If being, if, if what the world asserts is true, if being is the only thing that matters, Would we be here if Johnny had looked at how he felt and said, I think I'm in love with Julie. And that's good enough. I'll just sit here and enjoy how I feel about Julie. Would we be here today? I don't think so. If Julie had said, wow, Johnny likes me. I like this. That's good enough. I don't think we would be here today either. How do we understand love? What makes it real to us? Is it possible for us to experience love outside of doing? These are some of the questions that started to go through my mind as I thought about this event here today. And my mind went to a couple verses, and you can follow, try to follow along if you'd like. Uh, 1 John chapter 4 is the first place I'd like to go. And I want to just lift up a couple verses that really stood out clearly to me as I thought about some of these questions. I thought about how 
we understand love. And my mind went to 1 John 4, verse 19. It says, we love him. What's the rest of it? Does it stop there? Did our love for God start with us? Is it just that we've chosen to love God? No, it says we love him because he first loved us. And when that verse hit my mind, I thought, well, that's a performance-based relationship if I've ever seen one, because Jesus had to first do so that we could understand how he loves us. If you backtrack in that verse, in that chapter, just a little bit back to verse 9, it says, in this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. He sent his Son so that we could understand how real love is. In Romans 5, verse 8, but God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, I don't know what goes through your mind when you think of dying for somebody who hates your guts and wants to kill you. That is actually what Jesus did for every one of us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know what? I couldn't have done that. That is not what I find natural to do in myself. And we all know the verse, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Again, this is illustrated that God did something to communicate his love for us. Now imagine with me for just a little bit, and, and I will confess to you, this is just my imagination. This isn't Bible. But sometime in eternity past, before the creation of the world, and there's a little bit of a hint of this in Revelation, where John the writer says that he saw the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. I think sometime in eternity past, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit <coughs> sat down together and they said, how are we going to solve this sin problem that's going to happen. How are we going to communicate our love to mankind? And Jesus said, I'll go and I'll die for them in their place so that they can have a relationship restored with the Father. And you know what God could have done? You know what God the Father could have done in that moment? He could have turned to Jesus and he could have said, okay, I get it. I know you're willing to go do this. I know you're actually willing to go do everything we've talked about doing. But you don't have to. Because I know you have it in you to do it. That's good enough. Do you think that would have worked from our perspective? Jesus actually came and did. He came and lived a real life and died a very painful life bloody, gory death, all to make this real to each and every one of us. This is not just, he didn't leave it. He could have left it just a fluffy theological idea or belief, but he made it real. And because he made it real, we understand it in ways that we never would have if this would just be something that God would tell us could have happened. We can see he did it. That's doing. Jesus came and did so that we could understand his being. Get that? I want to change gears now just a little bit. And I debated last night, am I going to talk about this piece today? Because this is a piece that is often brought into wedding sermons. And uh, I had some misgivings, but I finally decided... I want to share from just a little bit of a different perspective from the passage in Ephesians chapter 5 that is so familiar where we often hear the headship order talked about um, from Ephesians chapter 5 verses 22 to 33. If you care to, turn to that. I'd like to just read it and hear what it says. And I want to make a few comments that may sound just a little different from what we are accustomed to hearing as we look at this passage and what we think. I don't want to do this because, frankly, this passage, 
And our response to it has created a lot of problems inside our marriages. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now, a lot of folks have a lot of hang-ups about this passage. And the passage, and this is why I want to talk about this, this passage is often twisted into something along the lines of, come on, wife, get in line behind me and my ideas. Can't you see that my way is the way this needs to be done? Can't you see this is what needs to happen? And you're supposed to submit to me, right? Because, hey... The Bible says so, right? It's right here. You can read it. I have one question for you men who are husbands and know what it means to be a husband. Look at verse 23 again. For the husband is the head of the wife. How? Even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Even as he died, for the church. That's how you are head of your wife. So here's the question. How many times has the Lord Jesus Christ come at you with a big hammer and said, you are going to do it this way? My way or the highway, buddy. This, this is how it is. Hey, if there's anybody who would have a right to do that, it would be Jesus Christ, wouldn't it? If you really stop and think about it, does he do that? No, he doesn't do that. When Jesus forces his way on you and railroads you into something you disagree with, guys, then we have the right to do that with our wives. And that ain't happened as long as Jesus is on his watch. And that's not changing. And I'll just be honest with you. I need this just as much as anybody else potentially sitting here. I deliberately left out verse 21 at the beginning of this passage. You might wonder why I skipped that. I wanted to come back to this. Look at what it says. This is what starts this whole passage off. Submitting yourselves to who? One to another in the fear of God. That makes it pretty simple, doesn't it? The only way that real love can exist inside a marriage is when two people work together to come into agreement with each other in a way that honors God. And I believe that under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, there is always a way to make that happen. And I don't know if you noticed, but I didn't really address the ladies in this, and I'm not going to many times that happens, but I'm kind of making a point here. I'm ragging on you guys for just a little bit because I need it just as much as the next one. You know what I find in my marriage is... It's the guy in my marriage who gets on the bulldozer and tries to push things around and make things go his way. And in my experience, as I observe couples, marriages, relationships that have gone to smash, I would propose to you that in most, if not all of those cases, if the man would be the husband and father, that he should be, according to these passages, the end result would be very different. <coughs> Men, women 
attempt to be followers. And I have yet to see a woman who wants to walk away from the man who truly loves and cherishes her heart. I want you to think about that. Husbands, the responsibility for our marriages, according to this passage, lies 100% on us. And here I say it, ladies, the responsibility for the success of our marriage lies 100% on you as well, as I understand this scripture. Well, verse 21 again, submitting yourselves one to another, how? In the fear of God. I think you get the point. I want to shift gears again just a little bit. And in this section, I want to talk about something called the cross. We go into our marriages and we expect to find joy. I fully think that Julie and Johnny expect this relationship to bring them a lot of joy. And I believe it will. We don't normally go into marriage looking for and expecting a cross. But I'll submit to you that somewhere along the way, every single marriage, every person who's part of a marriage, finds that there is a time when we disagree. We, there will be something come up. We'll disagree about something. What happens? It's in those times that we have an invitation to put our own personal desires and wishes ourselves on the cross. And you know what? That's not easy. We don't like doing that because the cross does not feel good. That is not a place of happiness. That is a place of pain and hurt. But I also submit to you that if we don't get on that cross, there's a lot of sorrow that is reaped because of our unwillingness to do that. There has never been a broken <laughs> marriage where selfishness had no role in the disaster. There's never been a broken marriage where selfishness did not somehow play a part in this. It is impossible to walk away from a relationship, whether you walk away literally in a divorce, whether you walk away emotionally, however that disconnect happens. It's not possible for that to happen without at least one person thinking that how I feel is more important than how the other person feels. <laughs> we often thank God that Jesus showed us how to live, but we rarely thank God that Jesus showed us how to die. We don't like dying. But we can't really live, really live, really enjoy life until we know how to die. How to die to these things, our goals, our dreams, our ambitions, all the things that that we have in the backs of our heads that we want to achieve and accomplish. I don't think we really know how to live until we know how to die to those things for the sake of someone else. There's an old proverb that I heard here a while ago that, that really kind of caught my attention. And it says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I think that's very scriptural. Micah 6 verse 8 is another verse that came to my mind as I, as I thought about all of these dynamics that come into play in a marriage. The prophet Micah summed up, I think, everything that we are being taught in the Old Testament into this one simple verse. He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Folks, when we do that in our marriage, it works in a way that honors God. I want to shift gears again just a little bit, and I want to talk a little bit about the impact of our relationship in marriage on other people and on each other. Recently, I was talking with a young couple who was <coughs> struggling with some issues in their marriage, and I became more aware of something that, that I think plagues me in our marriage, something that I've got to work on, something that uh, I think is just kind of a dynamic that is possibly more real today than it was maybe a hundred years ago. We need to plan time to connect with our spouse. <clears throat> the whole world runs on schedules. There's the schedule for church, there's the schedule for school, there's the schedule for job and college, and there's the schedule to pay bills. 
there's the schedule to pay your taxes and your insurance, and the universe runs on a schedule. The sun comes up, and there's sunset, and everything runs on a schedule. And you know what I find happening? I've noticed that what happens is we take care of all these other things that are on the schedule, and we forget that we're going to have to schedule time to take care of our marriage. And we get all these other things done, and what ends up happening is our relationship in our marriage is kind of an afterthought. We'll do that whenever all these other things get done, right? I think it's important, especially in today's world, for us to be able to schedule time in, into our schedule that is just as fixed and just as important as all of these other things, so that we get it done. Now, I'm, I'm not saying you have to do this a certain way, but I think it is helpful to realize that most of our lives are really very full, very busy, and unless we actually take time out of all these other things to work on our marriage, it might never happen. <coughs> What is your life focus? Is it to be rich, to be famous, to get ahead in life, so to speak? To be what? I would encourage all of us to remember that if our life focus this today is something other than learning to be and function like Jesus Christ, we stand a good chance of failing at whatever we are setting our hands to. Because really everything else is subheadings underneath, learning how to walk like Jesus does. Johnny and Julie, how you treat each other will have a profound impact on how your children, if God blesses you with children, on how your children will relate to each other and to other people, and how you honor people in authority, whether it's the ministers of your local church, the President of the United States, government authorities, the police, how you honor these people has a profound impact on how your children will view the authorities in their lives. If you trash talk the church leadership and, and other authorities in our lives, whoever that may be, it should be no surprise if children turn on their authorities, including us as parents. Ephesians 6 verse 4 says, Ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And Colossians 3.21 says, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Just last evening, my oldest son came to me. I was sitting out on the porch at our cabin. And he said, Dad, I want to ask you a question. And he told me about a conversation that he had with someone just recently. And I'll give you just a little bit of a snippet. And he was asking me what I thought about this. But this man was telling him that when he grew up, he had to do a lot of construction work, hard work, use a wheelbarrow to pour concrete and do those kinds of things. And this man has been successful in his business. He now has equipment to do this. He's got skid steer trucks. I don't know what all, but he uses equipment to do all the work that he used to do my head. What he was telling Sean was that when his sons are old enough to work, He's going to make them start with the wheelbarrow, too, so that they have to go through all the same things he had to, win, had to go through. Now, you may disagree with me here, but I want to propose something to you. Put yourself in the shoes of that young boy who is struggling to push a wheelbarrow full of cement. And I'll tell you what, guys, if you've ever had to push a wheelbarrow full of cement up a board ramp, that is hard work. I've been there and done it. I don't make a man out of you if nothing else will. But put yourself in the shoes of that young man who has to do that work and watch his daddy's equipment sitting off to the side knowing full well that they could be using that. How is that going to work? How's that going to be? Fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. I think if I was that boy, I'd have a real hard time feeling very good about that. That's just one illustration. But you know what, dads, love your children, love your boys and your girls the same way you wanted to be loved when you were a little boy or a little girl. Be the servant that you wish 
with serving you. Most of us are willing to talk about being servants. And this sounds great, and it feels good, right up until somebody treats us like a servant. And then the fangs and the claws come out, and we don't like it. Be the servant you wish was serving you. The reason, I want you to listen really carefully to this, because this is something that is very close to my heart. The reason we have such a hard time doing this is because we look at a situation in our marriage or our life and we see, I could serve this way, but I don't want to do it. The reason we don't do that, folks, is because we do not believe that God will bless our obedience and our service. I actually said that out loud. We don't believe it. We don't believe that God has ordered the world in such a way that things will work better for those who actually do what we are taught to do in Scripture, what Jesus teaches us to do, how Jesus teaches us to relate to each other. We believe that actions follow our emotions. That's true, right? Our actions do follow our emotions or we wouldn't be here today. But we miss the point that our emotions also follow our actions. There are times when I don't feel like doing the right thing. And if I choose to do the right thing anyway, what I've discovered is how I feel begins to follow what I do. The lie that Satan brings is that God will not bless your obedience. The reality that Jesus Christ brings into these relationships is that if we follow him and his way of doing things, we begin to learn how to have a relationship with God the Father and with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in that context, the context of a real relationship with God, that we actually begin to learn how to relate to others, even our difficult spouse. Don't get me wrong, my wife is not difficult. I'm the difficult one. I want to be really clear about that. But it's, it's in that context that we begin to learn how to relate to our spouse, our children, and the world around us. I read across a story as I was preparing for this, it was last week, I kind of stumbled across this story, and I thought the story so well illustrated the point that I'm trying to make. That I'm just going to take the time to read this story and follow up with just a few comments. The title of this story is How I Saved My Marriage, and it's written by Richard Paul Evans, who is an author, uh, when I mentioned the name of my wife, uh, she mentioned we have apparently a couple books by him, very interesting. Uh, but this is the story of what happened in his marriage. And I want you to just listen to what happens and connect it with some of the things we've been talking about here this afternoon. Dedicated to my sweetheart. My oldest daughter, Jenna, recently said to me, my greatest fear as a child was that you and mom would get divorced. Then when I was 12, I decided you fought so much that maybe it would be better if you did. Then she added with a smile, I'm glad you guys figured things out. For years, my wife Carrie and I struggled. Looking back, I'm not exactly sure what initially drew us together, but our personalities didn't quite match up. And the longer we were married, the more extreme the differences seemed. In fact, I'm sorry, encountering fame and fortune didn't make our marriage any easier. In fact, it exacerbated our problems. The tension between us got so bad that going out on a book tour became a relief, though it seems we always paid for it on re-entry. Our fighting became so constant, it was difficult to even imagine a peaceful relationship. We became perpetually defensive, building emotional fortresses around our hearts. We were on the edge of divorce, and more than once, we discussed it. I was on book tour when things came to a head. We had just had another big fight on the phone, and Carrie had hung up on me. I was alone and lonely, frustrated and angry. I had reached my limit. That's when I turned to God, or rather, turned on God. I don't know if you could call it prayer. Maybe shouting at God isn't prayer. Maybe it is. But whatever I was engaged in, I'll never forget. 
I was standing in the shower of the Buckhead Atlanta Ritz-Carlton yelling at God that marriage was wrong and I couldn't do it anymore. As much as I hated the idea of divorce, the pain of being together was just too much. Deep down, I knew that Carrie was a good person, and I was a good person. So why couldn't we get along? Why had I married somebody so different from me? Why couldn't she just change? Finally, hoarse and broken, I sat down in the shower and began to cry. In the depths of my despair, powerful inspiration came to me. You can't change her, Rick. You can only change yourself. At that moment, I began to pray. If I can't change her, God, then change me. I prayed late into the night. I prayed the next day on the flight home. I prayed as I walked in the door to a cold wife who barely acknowledged me. That night, as we lay in our bed, inches from each other, yet miles apart, I knew what I had to do. The next morning, I rolled over in bed next to Carrie and asked, how can I make your day better? <laughs> Carrie looked at me angrily. What? How can I make your day better? You can't, she said. Why are you asking that? Because I mean it, I said. I just want to know what I can do to make your day better. She looked at me cynically. You want to do something? Go clean the kitchen. She likely expected me to get mad. Instead, I just nodded. Okay. I got up and cleaned the kitchen. The next day, I asked the same thing. What can I do to make your day better? Her eyes narrowed. Clean the garage. I took a deep breath. I already had a busy day, and I knew she made the request in spite. I was tempted to blow up at her. Instead, I said, okay. I got up, and for the next two hours, I cleaned the garage. Carrie wasn't sure what to think. The next morning came. What can I do to make your day better? Nothing, she said. You can't do anything. Please stop saying that. I'm sorry, I said, but I can't. I made a commitment to myself. What can I do to make your day better? Why are you doing that, she said about you. I said, and our marriage. The next morning I ask again, and the next, and the next. Then, during the second week, a miracle occurred. As I asked the question, Carrie's eyes welled up with tears, and she broke down crying. When she could speak, she said, please stop asking me that. You're not the problem. I am. I'm hard to live with. I don't know why you stay with me. I gently lifted her chin until she was looking in my eyes. It's because I love you, I said. What can I do to make you day better? I should be asking you that. You should, I said, but not now. Right now, I need to be the change. You need to know how much you mean to me. She put her head against my chest. I'm sorry I've been so mean. I love you, I said. I love you, she replied. What can I do to make your day better? She looked at me sweetly. Can we maybe just spend some time together? I smiled. I'd like that. I continued asking for a month, and things did change. The fighting stopped. Then Carrie began asking, what do you need from me? How can I be a better wife? The walls between us fell. We began having meaningful discussions on what we wanted from life and how we could make each other happier. No, we didn't solve all our problems. I can't even say that we never fought again. But the nature of our fights changed. Not only were they becoming more and more rare, they lacked the energy they once had. We had deprived 